Leadership law number seven, the law of respect. People naturally follow leaders stronger than themselves. If you had seen her, your first reaction might not have been respect. She wasn't a very impressive looking woman, just a little over five foot tall in her late thirties with dark brown weathered skin. She couldn't read or write. The clothes she wore were coarse and worn. When she smiled, people could see that her top two front teeth were missing. Her employment was intermittent. Most of the time, she took domestic jobs in small hotels, scrubbing floors, making up rooms, and cooking. But just about every spring and fall, she would disappear from her place of employment, come back broke, and work again to scrape together what little money she could. When she was present on the job, she worked hard and seemed physically tough. But she also was known to have her bouts where she would suddenly fall asleep. Some coming in the middle of a conversation, she attributed her affliction to a blow to the head that she had taken during a teenage fight. Who would respect a woman like that? The answer is more than 300 slaves who followed her to freedom out of the South. They recognized and respected her leadership. So did just about every abolitionist in New England. The year was 1857. The woman's name was Harriet Tubman. While she was only in her 30s, Harriet Tubman came to be called Moses because of her ability to go into the land of captivity and bring so many of her people out of slavery's bondage. Tubman started life as a slave. She was born in 1820 and grew up in the farmland of Maryland. At age 24, she married John Tubman, a free black man. But when she talked to him about escaping to freedom in the North, he said that if she tried to leave, he'd turn her in. When she resolved to take her chances and go north in 1849, she did so alone without a word to him. Her first biographer, Sarah Bradford, said that Tubman told her, "I had reasoned this out in my mind. There was one of two things I had a right to: liberty or death. If I could not have one, I would have the other." Tubman made her way to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, via the Underground Railroad. A secret network of free blacks, white abolitionists, and Quakers who helped escaping slaves on the run. Though free herself, she vowed to return to Maryland and bring her family out. In 1850, she made her first return trip as an underground railroad conductor, someone who retrieved and guided out slaves with the assistance of sympathizers along the way. Each summer and winter, Tubman worked as a domestic, scraping together the funds she needed to make return trips to the South. And every spring and fall, she risked her life by going south and returning with more people. She was fearless, and her leadership was unshakable. Between 1850 and 1860, Harriet Tubman guided out more than 300 people, including many of her family members. She made 19 trips in all, and was very proud of the fact that she never once lost a single person under her care. Southern whites put a $12,000 price on her head, a fortune. Southern blacks simply called her Moses. By the start of the Civil War, she had brought more people out of slavery than any other American in history, black or white, male or female. Tubman's reputation and influence commanded respect, and not just among slaves who dreamed of gaining their freedom. People of prominence sought her out, such as Senator William Seward, who later became Abraham Lincoln's Secretary of State, and outspoken abolitionist. And former slave Frederick Douglass, Tubman's advice and leadership were also requested by John Brown, the famed revolutionary abolitionist. Brown always referred to the former slave as General Tubman, and he was quoted as saying, "She was a better officer than most whom he had seen, and could command an army as successfully as she had led her small parties of fugitives." That is the essence of the law of respect. Harriet Tubman. Would appear to be an unlikely candidate for leadership because the deck was certainly stacked against her. She was uneducated. She lived in a culture that didn't respect African Americans, and she labored in a country where women didn't even have the right to vote yet. Despite her circumstances, she became an incredible leader. The reason is simple: people naturally follow leaders stronger than themselves. Everyone who came into contact with her recognized her strong leadership ability and felt compelled to follow her. That's how the law of respect works.
people don't follow others by accident. They follow individuals whose leadership they respect. Someone who is an eight in leadership doesn't go out and look for a six to follow. He naturally follows a nine or ten. The less skilled follow the highly skilled and gifted. That's how the law of respect works. When people get together for the first time in a group, take a look at what happens. As they start interacting, the various leaders in the group immediately take charge. They think in terms of the direction they desire to go and who they want to take with them. At first, people may make tentative moves in several different directions, but after the people get to know one another, it doesn't take long for them to recognize the strongest leaders and to follow them. Usually, the more leadership ability a person has, the more quickly he recognizes leadership or its lack in others. In time, people in the group get on board and follow the strongest leaders. Either that. Or they leave the group and pursue their own agenda. I remember hearing a story from sports that shows how people come to follow strong leaders. It happened in the early 1970s when Hall of Fame basketball center Bill Walton joined Coach John Wooden's UCLA team. As a young man, Walton wore a beard. It has been said that the coach told him that his players were not allowed to have facial hair. Walton, attempting to assert his independence, said that he would not shave off his beard. Wooden's no-nonsense response was, "We'll miss you, Bill." Needless to say, Walton shaved the beard. There are many ways to measure a follower's respect for his leader, but perhaps the greatest test of respect comes when a leader creates major change in an organization. I experienced this test in 1997 when I moved my companies from San Diego, California, to Atlanta, Georgia. I made the decision to move in early 1996 while I was on a cruise in China with my wife Margaret. As we discussed the move and our expectations, I began weighing my level of influence with my core leaders. After mentally reviewing my personal history with each one, and the strength of my leadership with them, I estimated that about 50 percent of them would be willing to uproot themselves and make the move across country with me and the organization. A few months later, after Company President Dick Peterson and I worked through all the preliminaries of the move. I began the task of approaching my leaders individually to tell them about the decision to move, and one after another, the leaders told me they wanted to take the trip. I had expected about half to go. Imagine how delighted I was when I discovered that every single one of my core leaders was going with me, 100 percent. Why did so many make the trip? I know one of the reasons is that those leaders are difference makers. And they want to be a part of the vision of our organization. Another reason is that I've invested a lot of time and energy in my relationships with them, adding value to their lives. But there is another, more important reason. The two reasons I just named wouldn't have been enough if I would have been a weaker leader, because I've spent my whole life developing my leadership skills that has made it possible for me to lead other strong leaders. People who are nines and tens don't follow a seven. That's just the way leadership works. That's the truth of the law of respect.